Um, in 90 seconds, please state your name, the office you are seeking, and then answer the following question. What do you think are the most important solutions at the state level to address sea level rise and flooding? Hello everyone, I'm Clark Anderson. I'm running for Florida House District 30, which is the district just to the north of here. Uh, in Seminole, it encompasses Seminole and Orange County portions of it. Um, I, my background uh, started, I guess, I grew up in an environment with a mother who was an environmental activist in Illinois with the League of Women Voters. And she uh, later went on to uh, get countywide positions with the Illinois uh, Reclamation Board. Uh, they, she was a commissioner of the Metropolitan Sanitary District. So I grew up hearing about water, 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 and how to create, how to save it. Uh, they, she worked to save the Great Lakes, uh, worked to uh, mitigate stormwater flooding, uh, and then later uh, at, at the state level, uh, they had a unique judiciary there. She retired as a uh, as a leader uh, as at the appellate court level. Uh, they have a special technical judiciary that just handled environmental issues and how to, how to work with businesses and the EPA to get solutions done and had solutions that were adopted nationwide. So my entire school career was driving her to meetings and listening. Uh, I then studied it in college uh, in population geography. And then of course took everything that I knew about that and decided to go work in the oil field. Um, I'm, so I've worked offshore, and uh, I understand the risks and the, uh, of offshore drilling can bring. I was a mud engineer, um, which was a drilling fluid engineer. I was interviewed uh, for testimony after the Deepwater Horizon disaster and, and what happened to the regulatory environment that had been when I was there and how it had been eased under the Bush administration, which really caused that disaster. So I can sure talk about um, anything you'd like to know about why offshore drilling is a horrible thing uh, off the coast of the very dangerous drilling waters off of Florida. But then my career went in. Hi, I'm Joy Duff Marcel, and I'm running for Florida House District 30 as well. I was born and raised in this district, and my husband and I chose to raise our three children in this district. My parents are also native Floridians, so I spent my whole life hearing about how people were building in floodplains, and my mom was always um, picking up litter, and she was always teaching me how to recycle and all that before recycling was a big thing. Um, on the local level, we need to not build in wetlands. I've been on the city council serving for five years, and one of my accomplishments was working on a wetlands ordinance because developers were trying to put um, develop put their retention ponds in the wetland so they could have more developable land and um, we need to stop that at the local level at the state level we need to have growth management plans in place and agent the um, back when scott was elected he pretty much dismantled the growth management plan agency and policies. We need to reinstate that and we need to fund it and, and have people who are experts on planning to work on everything for the whole state. So that's at the state level. And at the federal level, we need to fund the big projects and work on, um, for example, I'm just going to give an example, the uh, Lake Okeechobee dike. That needs to be reinforced and that helps us clean the water. So that will help a lot with the sea level rise. Um, I have the luxury of being the only candidate from Florida House 47 here tonight to address you. My name is Stockton Breeds and I am running for Florida House 47. I'm currently the executive director of the Center for Public Safety and a partner in Architects Design Group. Going back to the question that I would say, as Joy alluded to, you have to be proactive about these things with the use of our comp plans, our development plans, what we allow, where we allow, how much we allow. You also have to take a look at what's uh, necessary to deal with immediately in terms of pre-mitigation. There are programs out there we've helped our city and client county get through pre-mitigation grants with FEMA to address certain issues uh, such as title serves and things like that. The last thing I would say is you have to deal proactively with infrastructure. As the video alluded to earlier, 
you know, water falls in the sky, you have uh, water coming up, and you have stormwater surge and tidal surge. So it's how you move water, whether it's through sewers, whether it's through trenches, whether it, you know, what you do with that water, how you do it, where you do it, has to be addressed, but it has to be done in a proactive, forward-thinking manner so you're not dealing, as most government does, which is behind the curve in hindsight, reacting to something that's already happened rather than planning for something that could happen or should happen. Great, thank you uh, for your introductions and your answers. I um, want to remind the audience, please send up your questions. Um, if you've written them down, just raise your hands and we'll come get them, collect them, and bring them to me. So, we um, really encourage you to do that. Um, the next question for all candidates, um, you'll have one minute to respond. This time we'll go left to right. Um, what role should the state education system play in education on sea level rise? Is there an education program you would champion? Well, I, my son is 16, going on 17, my daughter is 11. Both kids spent a week in respective camps. My son was up in Georgia learning about tidal flats and marshes. My daughter spent a week down at Ease. When I think back to the things that I was involved in at the junior high, and I'm old enough to say junior high, not middle school, and the one thing that stuck out that I remember was uh, people came from Cape Canaveral when the shuttle program was getting started, and they were able to demonstrate you know, what would happen if you put a blowtorch on one of the shuttle tiles. My point saying is that when you are able to successfully combine something that's both educational and something that's interesting to learn, it stuck with me and I still remember that to this day. So I would say in terms of education, if we would look for those programs that could combine something that would teach the kids and make it fun and interesting to learn, number one, I think they're going to retain it better. And, and number two, I think they're better able to act on it in the future as they go on to whatever chosen profession they engage in. Yes, I agree we need to start early and often with the education for the children in, in the public schools. And then um, this education needs to continue as adults. I mean, most people don't realize all the, what's going on with the sea level rise. Because we're candidates and we're invited to this forum, um, we were given a lot of information. Um, I'm, I like to think of myself as a person who stays informed, but when you find out all the details that is going on with the sea level rise, you realize that it is a really big problem and it needs to be addressed and it needs to be brought out into the open so people know it. And this administration that we have right now was sweeping it under the rug and not even admitting that there's climate change. Yeah, I think that education uh, programs are, are going to be a key to changing the public opinion, changing uh, having students and youth educated to bring that message home to their parents. This is going to be a multi-year, multi-generation problem that Florida is going to face. Uh, we're in a state that uh, has great beauty, but unfortunately is probably the most threatened state in the nation with environmental change. And uh, so I don't know generally, you know, level, certainly an education system is good. IFIS has wonderful programs in, in all sorts of areas. The state can develop curriculums, the local governments can. But I think that the, uh, we also need to have, at a technical level, we need to have uh, scientific programs that are going to talk about environmental engineering. They're going to talk about how are we going to, how are we going to mitigate uh, the rising water? How do things move inland? How does, you know, virtually every single thing uh, that this state has is going to be important. And, you know, hopefully we develop scientists and engineers that go into businesses and make a great deal of money solving these problems and take it to the world. And Florida can be a leader in this. Great, thank you. Thank you for your uh, answers. Next question. Um, again, we'll go from right to left. Uh, one minute to respond. Under what conditions do you feel it is appropriate to use tax dollars to fund sea level rise resilience activities? And what efforts, if any, would you champion in the state legislature to fund sea level rise and flooding resilience efforts? Well, as, as, as Joy pointed out, we're going to have to actually have a legislator that admits that there's a problem. 
um, you know, that the idea of not even, not, you know, that, are, that the risk exists, we're just going to ignore it, is not really a business solution, it's not a state solution. Of course it's going to take the federal government, the state government, and tax, and local entities working together to come up with a comprehensive plan, and to implement that plan, uh, it's going to take the insurance industries. We saw it after Andrew hit when we saw how uh, all levels of government and industry and housing came together to create the Dane County Code to build our homes, build homes that can withstand a hurricane. We can build homes that withstand floods. Uh, it's called going up in the air sometimes. So yes, it's going to take tax dollars. It's going to take at, at every level, um, and that I think the money should be spent after a comprehensive study and looks at what are the ways that we can actually solve these problems. And it's and again, it's going to be a long-term solution. What's interesting about that is that the public already approved taxes for the environment. And they passed Amendment 1, I think it was 75%, and we, then the legislature would not fund the trust that was brought by the people. So I have found in my studying of this issue is that the people are willing to be taxed and not fight it. And meanwhile, the legislature is trying to stop us being able to tax ourselves for that by causing um, additional hoops to step through, like the super majority tax. I believe that's coming up on the ballot in November. So please study your amendments very closely because a lot of times when people see something that says tax, they think, oh, I need to stop that because it's a tax. But um, a lot of times there's a reason why there's going to be a tax and it's going to help our environment greatly. Well, I guess my approach is a little bit more about how to address the immediate need that we've got now. And I would think that you know, going back to looking at a more proactive way of doing comprehensive planning at the county, uh, state, and the regional level. You know, we have seven, what, seven water management districts throughout the state of Florida that don't necessarily coordinate with each other on any given day of the week. Uh, I think the biggest problem that we have statewide is that all the entities and all the players and all the agencies that are involved, we don't get a lot of communication among them about what they're doing and why they're doing it, who they're doing it with. And I would think that at the state level, what we could do is to foster that level Communication, so that we all have a better understanding of what's going on and use that to pre-plan and if it's trying to do things like restore barrier islands or restore you know coastal areas that provide a buffer to any kind of things that perhaps we devoted I believe it's the forever Florida money funds that we voted on uh, address a percentage of those to look at this specifically in those areas and right now it seems to be mostly South Florida so it's kind of odd to say that somebody from Central Florida recognizes there's a problem in South Florida and is willing to stand up and say, hey, we need to do something about it proactively. Great, thank you. Uh, we received uh, two uh, audience questions of very similar nature. Um, so I'll, I'll read it and then if we need context, we can, I can talk about it, I guess. Should Floridians at large continue to subsidize the high cost of insurance for coastal homes? Well, I'll tell you something that's a little different about me. I'm the first one to say, look, I'm on this side of 50. There's a lot of things I know. There's a lot of things I don't know. And I'm not fully conversant with the insurance industry or what they do and how they do it. It's just not part and parcel of what I've done over the years. Uh, I've tried to learn things as we go along. I think everybody at this table will. Uh, and try to, I know that the numbers of citizens have gone down over the years. I know that the goal is eventually to get uh, that down to where it's not needed anymore. But I would think that if you look at where you pay insurance, if there are zones, if there are places that if you live on the coast, you should pay a higher premium than somebody lives inland. Uh, and you should pay basically based on where you are and the type of land you have, the type of property you have, the value of the property you have. So that would be my stab at that little question. That's a very good question. And I'm not sure if I if I've made up my mind on that, except that I do agree with Stockton that if you live in a very high risk area and you choose to move there, that you will have a higher premium 
Um, but based on the research and what's happening in South Florida, we know there's going to be a problem down there, and we know it's just a matter of time. So um, what I also read about was climate migrants, people who are actually beginning to move now um, and establishing them, their new homes in North Florida and, and Central North Florida. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot more of that. We're going to see a lot of people realizing that they need to move to higher ground. I think that Florida needs to work together. Every one of us has to face climate change. It's not somebody's wealthy on the coast. I came from the Tampa area where in Clearwater, those are not wealthy people. They're retirees living in, living in manufactured housing. They face the risk like we face the risk, and I think we face risk a lot better when we hang together and not worry about that. Insurance rates are different. We're going to have to fight through that. There's things we can do today. Today we changed the problem. We, I spoke about you know how the state came together with a plan to uh, you know when we had the Dade County Code for Hurricanes. We can make climate homes. We can raise them up. We can have zero energy homes that cost you know two percent more, but they save one hundred and forty dollars a month in electric bills. We can do a lot of things. Um, yes, we know we're going to have to relocate families away from the coast, and that's going to take time. But we can change our building codes today so that a coastal home is no more at risk of flooding than a home in, in Orlando. And we can have realistic floodplains that look 100 years out and say, this is where the homes need to be. We're not going to build homes that flood. And that, that can be a first step that doesn't cost anything from the taxpayers. The insurance industry uh, is going to be a tough, tough situation. Thank you. Uh, Next question, uh, right to left, one minute. What is your single most significant personal, professional accomplishment regarding sea level rise, the environment, energy conservation, or sustainability? Well, from a personal level, I uh, converted the home that we live in in Winter Park. Uh, we have solar panels, we have the LEDs, we reduced our energy as much as possible. Do I have to do that? No, I just feel better as a person knowing that uh, we have, uh, that we're contributing less to climate change. It's, it's, you know, it's a minuscule amount, but it's important to set an example. I think at a personal level, people uh, need to look at how their communities are addressing these things uh, and how they, can, how they can set examples for their children and for their neighbors. And, I think everyone here is gathered. If you, if you wouldn't be here tonight if it wasn't an issue that you feel personally about. At a personal level, I would say I've been raising three children. They're not completely raised yet, but um, my oldest son is studying engineering, and he told me that he wanted to study um, treating the water, the, the saltwater intrusion, and, and that was just that was just a wonderful thing to hear as a mom. Um, and I feel like all my children are very um, aware of what's going on in the environment and, and very um, mindful of that. Um, on a other level, I think I mentioned already that I worked on the wetlands ordinance and I was proud of that. Um, also on council, we have been constantly assaulted our home rule and that was one of the reasons I was wanting to run because I feel that local governments, if they want to pass a ban on plastic bags, they should be able to do that. If they want to make their tree ordinance more strict, they should be able to do that as well. And, and the, um, the state government has come after local governments for even passing fertilizer ordinances, trying to stop them from doing that. Um, so I'm, I'm a very big proponent of home rule. Well, I've got a little bit of a different take. Um, in 1980, our firm designed a building in Brevard County called the Florida Solar Energy Center. Raise your hand if you've heard of it. Okay, that's the most I've gotten out of any crowd so far. Uh, my dad was the architect of record. I met Dr. David Block. I will tell you that after that experience, every building that we've done throughout the state of Florida and across this country, we're working in 16 states, uh, we try to bring energy, life cycle, uh, water savings, we try to treat our buildings, and they're all city and county buildings, by the way, police stations, fire stations, emergency operations centers, public works facilities. 
We try to treat these buildings as an organic entity that breathes, that moves water through. We try to use uh, natural plants and legislation and zero scaping. And we try to use textiles, furniture, and fixtures that are beneficial to human physiology and don't impact the, the, uh, the, the environment in a certain way. But the other thing I would tell you is, I can't tell you how many city, county meetings I've gone to where I've tried to make the argument to mayors and council people about the benefit of doing these energy saving life cycle cost uh, systems. And um, that's something that we put in all of our buildings. And we try to take the lead in driving these folks to that type of building and that type of building system rather than wait for them to tell us to come at it. So I think we've been a leader, architecturally speaking, across the country in getting our clients to do those kinds of buildings. Great, thank you. Doing okay? I feel like I'm just rocket firing questions at you guys. It's not the intention, but you're, you're answering them well, so I'll keep going. Do you think cities and counties in Florida should have access to state funds for flood mitigation project, projects? Why or why not? Well, I think that the pools of money are there at the federal and state level. I think most of the money that's there comes through FEMA, comes through the pre-mitigation grants, and some of the grants that we work with at the federal level. I think the problem is if you get down to some of the smaller, and I'm, you know, listen, I go back to what Joy said, all of our clients are cities and counties across this country, and I don't like unfunded state mandates when they come back to my city and my county and tell them that you have to do this. But there are certain standards that have to be set statewide and otherwise that you can't have one city trying to spend money to do this if it's not going to be a cost efficient, there's not the cost benefit ratio. Every grant that we have to go for for our cities and counties has to have that uh, analysis, that cost benefit analysis. So I think you have to have at some level somebody who can make an executive decision or a decision period about what will get funded, why and how, with the understanding of what that's going to return to the community where those funds are spent. I absolutely believe that the state should provide mitigation for the local governments. Um, if that, I mean, I, I feel that falls under the Forever Florida. They can buy up um, wetlands and um, even if, with the Seminole County rural boundary issue, um, they can buy up the property there or at least help the counties raise the money. Um, and as I said before, the counties and cities have been happy to pass a tax to help with the environmental issues. It, it, it crosses both party lines. There, all the, everyone wants to live in a clean environment with clean water and not worry about their home flooding. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, my, my background is I, I had a career in working with multi-agency uh, task forces, federal, state, local, here in Florida. Um, this is going to touch everyone. It's going to first uh, get back, we need a comprehensive plan. Uh, the plan has to look at, at all levels of government. It has to be a work-with situation. It's not going to be done in the short term. It's a long-term issue that's going to be tough. One of the toughest challenges Florida's ever faced is going to be the sea level rise. And of course, everyone in the state, uh, you know, fighting over funds is not the way to solve the problem. The way to solve the problem is work with a comprehensive plan that includes every level of the municipality, every level of, of the government, work it and, and start to solve the problems as we can. It's going to be bond issues, it's going to be all sorts of things that are out of the control of the local level. They need support. Thank you. Our uh, final question for this panel uh, is as follows. What solutions for affordable housing and disasters like hurricanes? Well, certainly build it right the first time. Uh, build it to withstand a hurricane, understand that uh, Hurricanes are going to bring stronger winds. Uh, they're going to bring uh, higher levels of flooding, and sea level rise is just going to make it worse. So the housing that we provide has to be in an area that makes sense based on new uh, redrawn floodplains. If we need to relocate people uh, instead of rebuilding in the same areas, uh, that's desirable so you don't get a repeat and a repeat and a repeat. Most flood uh, money that goes out goes out because to areas that repeatedly flood we need to address those first and uh, you know don't don't put the houses where they shouldn't be 
I believe this was touched on with the last panel about the Sadowski Fund and how the legislature keeps rating that fund and not using it where it's supposed to be used. I, I think this would be an example of where they could use it um, to provide affordable housing that is not in a floodplain. Um, that would be a really good use of that money. Um, also, when I was answering the last question um, about the coast, and I was imagining these, about the insurance, and I was imagining these very wealthy people on the coast who keep building their mansion again and again, um, but there's also the people who do not have the money to get out of the floodplain, and, and those people do need to be helped. Um, by either by the state government or federal or, or matching funds from the federal to the state. Well, I'm going to call back on the design and planning background and say that you know when you have, uh, especially areas that are large development areas, and the development comes through with their plan that they're coming before the city or council or regional board. But I've always felt that personally that they should have a requirement that there be a set aside for affordable housing within that plan development, whether for whatever level that is, if it's 10%, 20%, that there should be a mix of housing, there should be a mix of retail, a mix of commercial, so that you have communities that are almost self-sustaining, you know, if you know that you could uh, move from here, go to a grocery store, and you could walk to this place and walk to that place. If you do it proactively and you plan for affordable housing, affordable housing should be built into anything and everything that we do. That's just my feeling. Your audience, please uh, thank our candidates. For